Uh, I'll only cast actors who'll join me in the bar for a drink. That sounds like a very good plan. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome to episode 10 of Interval Conversations. I'm very happy to be joined today by Mr. Robert Marsden, I believe it's this side. I can never tell. So, uh, Robert, how are you doing? I'm very well, how are you? I'm very good. Uh, now, Robert is a professional director. So, I, he's always come into the bar that I work at every year when he directs the Halifax Panto, and I've seen him in some states. But, you know, uh, all my... You know all my secrets. Oh, yes. So, uh, Rob, uh, how did you actually get your start in theatre and directing? Uh, well, it was, I wanted to be an actor initially, as I think yeah. a lot of people do. Yeah, we all do. University. Then we learn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to, I was at university, I studied drama, and I always had the intention to go and do a postgraduate acting degree, because I did want to do a drama degree, because I'd done youth theatre and amateur theatre and um, but I'd never I didn't do GCSE drama or A level or BTEC so I thought well I'll go and do a, a really practical drama degree and then I'll do a post-grad acting degree because I do want to, to do that I, um, so because yeah growing up with youth theatre and all of that was was so formative um, but I thought I want to study this actually and get to know, know it a little bit so I went to um, what was the University of Wales I think it's Aberystwyth University now on the on the coast for three years in the in the 90s um, and when I was there I there was this module in the second year called directing <laughs> oh go on, I'll have a go at that um, and then I realized that um, I was a far stronger director than I was an actor, but I loved the acting process. So I realised on that module um, that that my skills lay elsewhere. Um, and then I did more and more advanced, I'm still doing bits of acting with the theory and got us to do more and more directing at university, which was great. And in my year at university with people like Craig Ells, who went on to play Miss Trunchbull in, in the West End, and Richard Sutton, a really strong actors and I could see from the outside that I was never I was never going to get a job <laughs> as an actor um, I was all right but I wasn't going to make a living from it but I loved directing and I loved working with actors on the rehearsal room floor so I fell into it really at university um, and then started to do some assistant directing after university and I was quite lucky because um, at the time you could still get some assistant directing posts yeah. you know you didn't um, uh, so now, now the, the, the more traditional route is to probably go on to um, postgrad at a drama school or Birkbeck, the directing courses, or to, to do um, still things like the regional young theatre director scheme and, and so on. Um, but yeah, I, I started to work um, as an assistant director in some of the regional repertory theatres around the country, and, and um, my stripes, as it were, on the job. Um, so that's so that's how I got into into directing. But I always loved theatre from a young age. Always absolutely loved it. Oh, the joy of the theatre. <laughs> so uh, could you tell us about a few of the shows you've worked on over the years? Yeah, I've, as you know, and, and I know you've had Billy and Neil on, yeah. uh, as you know, one of my big specialisms is, uh, is pantomime, which yeah. I know we might talk about in a bit. Um, so I've done 25, 26 professional pantos, love it. Been in at Halifax for a decade doing the, the Christmas shows there. Um, but I, I, I ended up doing, I've ended up doing more musicals and pantomimes, but I, I started off doing more plays <laughs> and, and uh, doing John God for Teachers. Um, God Charlie's for <laughs> yes, yeah. Charlie's Aunt, doing Romeo and Juliet and, and I set up my own company and I was able to do a lot of work through that, which was great. I'd certainly advise that. Get your own work on. Get your own yeah. company going. That's why I've set my company up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. the best way. And then you learn by your mistakes. Um, and you can. And I, was, and I was doing that alongside assisting. So I was directing my own company and assisting other directors like Alan Aitbourne and Chris Monks and people like that and learning my craft through assisting. And then I was able to kind of apply it through my own company. Um, so I've really enjoyed a variety of stuff, really. Everything from from Shakespeare through to um, musicals, pantomimes, uh, and developing some new writing. And for the last two years, I've worked for Swanage Rep uh, Theatre and uh, Leatherhead Rep, and they've 
it's through one company and they're they're reigniting repertory uh, so we've spent um spent some time i've spent some time um going back to my roots and doing more plays again um on the, in the summer in the regional rep so done giving up appearances um uh, yes prime minister and uh uh, and a couple of fa love family shows. So we've just done the Secret Garden and the Railway Children with them. And um, we're looking to develop a new musical. It was going to be this summer, but probably be following summer now. Um, developing a new musical of um, a version of the Prince and the Pauper, but the Princess and the Pauper, taking oh, right. them out to yeah. and uh, and uh, and working with a writer called Dave Simpson on that. So I've done a lot of new writing and development work as well. So I've skipped flitted around a bit. Specialism is pantomime, but I have, I've, I've flitted. I've been a bit of a magpie and taken bits from everywhere and I've been a bit of a cuckoo going from one nest to the, to the next. Um, so yeah, but I love it. I love, I love all the different genres, Nathan. I really do. It's, I don't want to ever get stuck just doing, just doing one or two uh, genres or styles. So has there been a personal highlight? of the like a certain production certain working with a certain performer well i've got to say neil working with neil Hurst for 10 years yeah. um, <laughs> that would nearly kill me though no i'm joking i'm joking, I'm joking in pantomime your one of your earlier um podcasts i i do you know i i loved one of my first professional productions and I still think it's a highlight was Charlie's aunt I had Craig Ells, Richard Sutton, Derek Parks and all these these actors and I was tw I was 20 I was and it's still a highlight for me because I had some really good actors and I was 20 and directing people with far more experience than, than me in their 50s 60s and 70s and uh, you know when you do a production that changes you and you learn a lot from it yeah. it's your breakthrough production um, it's a farce, you know, ten people on stage. So I was working out how do I, how do I, how do I shape this? You can't just leave things to chance in farce. You've got to, and the timing. And I was, le I was learning on the job as a, I was directing it and leading the company. But there were really experienced actors in the room. I remember um, and learning from them and watching them do their crafts. So Derek Parks had worked on farces for years and all around the UK and brought all that wealth of experience with him. And I was, and I was a director in awe. I was having to direct this man who had far more experience than me in farce. And I love that. Charlie's on. It's an Edwardian farce with 10 actors, loads of mishaps with a man dressing up as a woman, pretending to be uh, the aunt and so on. And, uh, and I think this probably relates to pantomime. I love that. You've got Pablo <laughs> Pabli and a graduate dressed up, a man dressed up as a woman and it's a pantomime dame in all in all lessons but I do remember that was a very early production that I worked on but do thinking wow as, uh, as a director I loved working I was Alan Aitborn's assistant and I loved that because I was watching him that was the art of what not to say you don't have to say a lot as a director I really remember learning from that it's about not what you it's about not how much you say but what you say and when you say it you can say very little but as long as you can give a note to a certain actor in a certain way to unlock their creativity because I, I think the director's job is to unlock the actor's uh, talent as it were and to support them and be the outside eye and what Nick Heitner and Adrian Noble and all this and Aria Manushkin all these directors say you just have to say something useful and I learned that from Alan Hickborn, just to say, Nathan, just one or two things. You didn't have to do a lot, but say the right thing at the right time in the right way can really unlock so, so much. So I think they're quite early on in my career thinking about productions. And that was a production called Sugar Daddies that toured, that toured the UK and we started that in Guildford. And they're two productions. Uh, Charlie's Aunt was late 90s and that was early 2000s with Alan Hickborn. And they're early doors ones. I, I love doing so many productions, don't get me wrong, but I think I learned most about the directing process. That They really changed me and, and uh, I learned so much on the job for those two, two productions. Yeah. But actually, that last sentence actually leads on to the next question. Uh, what is your directing process? So. <laughs> oh, oh my, you've got a good, I love these good questions. For Okay, so depends on the genre, and it depends how much time you've got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so in a commercial, let's take commercial panto. You've got two weeks rehearsal. You've got a week in the rehearsal room, and then a week in the theatre, essentially, and then, and then you open. And that's so that's time bound. 
and it's big. You've got big production values. You're trying to get on the scale of a West End musical with moving lights and, and ensemble and, and kids and, and, and actors and, and so on. So, so if you're talking about kind of a commercial pantomime, uh, then it's about making sure that everyone feels really confident and really safe and that it's secure and that it's blocked and it's shaped and, and you're working with it and everyone feels confident at the end of the first week. So I think a big part of my work is whatever genre I'm in is to get the actors to feel confident and yeah. to get, because they're, they're on at the end of the day. I'm not, I go, Ken Ray talks about this. He says, uh, he's an actor trainer at Gildor. He says, the director's on the first plane out of there. You know, so, so what you leave, what you leave has to be really secure and safe and that the actors have ownership by the end of the process, whether that's a one week rehearsal, a two week, three week, four week, eight weeks in some of the big organizations, whatever that is, Nathan, my, my biggest part of my process is to get the actors to, to get into the driving seat and take the ownership of the project. But yeah, it just depends on the genre and time. Like if you work in, in three weeks on a, on a two-hander, um, just two actors in the space, you don't have to do a lot of blocking. The actors will block themselves if you get the furniture in the right place, you know where the entrances and exits are. If the actors are motivated by what they say and who they're saying it to and why they're saying it, they'll move themselves. They'll, it's called organic blocking, they'll organically block themselves. So I don't have to do a lot of blocking with, with certain genres and certain productions. But if you're talking about musicals and pantomimes, really, the more and more people you get on stage, the more and more focus as a director yeah. you have to be. You want the act got the audience to go oh I'm looking over here I'm looking over there um so um uh so, so I, but I, I would say that making sure that I get out the way when when I need to and making sure that the actors go up with confidence uh, in front of that uh, in front of that first audience I think that's important but there's so many so many variables which is what I what I love about directing yeah. Yeah. direct Shakespeare from a musical from a Greek from a new writing piece you know when I've directed shows like at university, college, uh, I try to be the relaxed director. Works like I'm like, all right, let's plot this. Yep, you can do that. And trust my actors. Then it gets close to the show where you come like, right, come on. I, and I always say, and it, linking in with what you're saying there, Nathan, I think I always talk about rehearsals moving from content to form. So yeah. the early part of the rehearsals, you're playing around with content, you're bashing ideas around, you're exploring what's possible, you're exploring what might work, what might not work. And then bit by bit, that content stage and exploring and bashing things around, like you were saying, near the end, it becomes more about the form. I've got to get it to a, a physical form that's going to go on in front of an audience. And I also, I, I'd also say that I like to try and work all directors work differently, as you know, and um, every actor works differently, but I do try and like to work through the play quite quickly. So I know a, a rough roadmap, as it were. So it's like sketching and drafting out, and then bit by bit, you fill in lots more detail and lots more detail, and that's organically happening as well. But yeah, as you said, it's, uh, it, it, I like that idea about being relaxed. Because you get your best work out of your actors yeah. if, if it's yeah. a relaxed room. You've got to, Bella, Bella Merlin talks about you've got to be vulnerable. Uh, you know, how, how are you vulnerable if your person at the front is some kind of dictator? <laughs> um, you, you've, got to be, you've got to have a bit of tough love along the way. Oh, yeah. Because, but, but yeah, you're right. It's, um, you've got to get to a form that's got to go up, particularly in um, uh, particularly when there's big bucks in commercial theatre. Yeah. You know, I'm here as a director to, to work for a company, to serve the company. Um, I, it's my responsibility to get everyone that point we're all gonna we're all gonna get to to we're all gonna get to Birmingham at that time <laughs> and we, leave, we leave at this time we get there at that time and then lots of stuff happens in the middle but I've got to get everyone uh, to the destination so do you have any production like horror stories like backstage and rehearsals um, and when yeah, you're doing drills I think I'd be really lucky I think I think some of the horror stories comes from like um because everyone's in, in, particularly in rehearsals, everyone is so, so uh, entrenched in what they're doing. Um, so, so often, so, so I, for example, if you're working with, with loads of kids in the room, you have to be really careful not, not to swear or not to, so, so a lot of horror stories is about people trying to be so good at times in the rehearsal yeah. room uh, as well. I think, um, 
I've, I've really been pretty lucky, I think. Yeah. I've heard lots of horror stories from different directors, like real horror stories, um, when, when actors have turned up drunk at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I've been really lucky. So I can't give you like a, I'd love to be able to give you a, a great anecdote that will go down in, in history. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, Nathan, if I do have a horror story, I promise yeah. I will. Yes, yeah. I will. Uh, yeah. So, but no, I've uh, no, I've been lucky. Yeah, that's good. Uh, well, we've already touched. My next question was going to be, how does your directing approach differ with different shows? But we've already touched upon that, which is good. Um, so, I just can I can I add something to that, Nathan? Do you mind if I add something? Yeah, of course. I think you've got to know what genre you're in as well when yeah. you direct. So, like. I've got to know, and you've got to get everyone looking like they're in the same production. So, so in um, in a music musical or Shakespeare, there's this big truth, isn't there? There's a there's a truth, but it's relative. It's, it's big. It's got a it's got a size and an energy to it, but it's still got to be rooted in some kind of truth. So, another thing that I'm looking for as a director is to work out what the the in inverted commas the truth is for the production you're working on, but also the genre you're working in. So, like in Panto, there's no point trying to be psychologically realistic um so that's a, so so sometimes inside for particularly like actors who've not done a lot of panto and they come and they think they're marlon brando or, or or trying to play it really realistically and you're going yeah there's realism but it's a it's a big realism it's a big truth yeah. um so yeah that's another thing i'd add nathan to, to 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 think about what genre you're in and making sure everyone looks like they're in the same same yeah. production as well that's good so finally going on to pantomimes so um is there anything you contribute to so have you got a script and you're like that doesn't work i want to add this so do you try get anything in like you like like favorite routine yeah. yes so like um normally because i work for um uh, work for a company as a freelancer called Imagine Theatre within Halifax and traditionally about a year in advance I would start working with the writer and the production company to start to think about okay what's the what's the story we're going to tell and then where are the options for new things where are we going to what routines might we want to put in and then you start getting the actors involved because they'll bring all of their toolkit as well and their experience and what they want to do so you might talk with the dame and the comic about what they want to add in as well and it takes it's about a year in advance you, you know this from from your experience that um people think it's put together like in a heartbeat like in the, yeah in a, in a week and there's a whole whole machine going on for about a year a year a year and a half even with the title that's chosen for the for the following year so i do i like to get i like to make sure that um that i've got my, my stamp on it as it were uh, and like you get to know um you get to know an audience you get to know a venue and what the audience is like so uh, and what what component parts they want in and, and what you're going to put in that's new this year uh, whether it's a routine or a musical number or uh, a, an actor brings something that we've not had in a venue before so it's important really to, to to work on that in advance and not of course you get in the rehearsal room and loads of ideas come out and jokes and gags and little bits but the bigger stuff you've got to work in advance because if you want props making or uh, you've got tracks that need recording it's got to all be done so far in advance that's a big thing certainly for me and and people do think oh you just throw it on and you're like no there's a whole craft and an art and art that's gone into all of this uh for, for many a year over yeah because i love oh, especially around christmas time when panto's on all, all the cash used to come in and yourself choreographer and you <laughs> like i think when you did peter pan you had a crocodile made for that production yeah yeah and it broke <laughs> Yes, <laughs> a big expensive it, crocodile. It broke, <laughs> and then you're frantically kind of go, okay, when are we going to get it fixed, and what are we going to do? But that was a good idea of when, for example, we that was a good that's a good example of when I worked with um, the producer and we said and the writer we said actually we want a really big crocodile. We don't want it to just to be a sound effect because yeah. often sometimes you just you just hear it. In the back yeah. Of my mind see a splash or a tail we wanted to see this crocodile that's the that's what hope fears and that's a really good example you're talking you about a year in advance and and we're able then to work yeah it did it did break we got it back together and, and you're thinking oh my word it's such an important moment I've got to get yeah. it fixed um but yeah uh, so that's a good example of when we're really tailoring stuff 
and what we want to do with the story. Has there ever been a year where you've got the script and you've basically had to go, right, we're redoing this. <laughs> like, we have to work, rework this script. In Halifax, we're blessed with some really good writers. So we've had Will Brenton, Ian Lachlan, uh, Eric Potts. So th they know their craft, they know their art. And what's really lovely is that we've then got the space to put our own stuff in. So we've got a really strong story, because for me it's about story and spectacle, yeah? And we've got a really strong story. Um, I did do a production, Venue and Company Will Remain Nameless, years ago, and it was literally, because you used to get your scripts and it would just have huge gaps in it. You get some lines, it would say, insert comedy routine here, insert comedy, you kind of come on the first day of rehearsal and think, oh my word. Because um, it was from a very different tradition 20 years ago that people yeah. would hand, hand stuff down in the rehearsal room. Oh, I'll show you how, how we do the, I'll show you how I would like to do the balloon ballet, Rob, and, and so on. And that's, that's disappeared out now. So as, as those traditions have disappeared and those, you've ended up, the scripts have got, and larger and larger because the routines are now written into the script whereas before yeah. it used to be blank and insert something here insert busy bee here insert tiddly yeah. tree or to our, to our days <laughs> so it's really great to actually get a strong script with a strong story that you can then as you're saying then you can work within because at the end of the day i'm directing eric potts script i don't he, he should be able to come and see that production and go, that's, that's, that is my show up there. <laughs> I've not ripped it apart. I've not been disrespectful to the writer. That's, that's the, they're the words that I've crafted and worked over. And like with what's good about if you're working properly as a director you're in communication with your writers. So you're saying, Eric, what about this? What about Will? Could we, could we try and do this? So, uh, so I would, don't be afraid, directors coming up, don't be afraid to, to, to talk to your writers and don't be don't be um um don't be arrogant to think oh, i can just change this and no one will mind yeah. uh, i i had that i had that um the company and director shall remain nameless but um it's a production of my dick whittington script and they changed 50 percent of it gosh gosh then so then i went to see it i went what have you done what <laughs> have you done but I had an argument with the director on the stage and it basically ended with him saying, what makes you think you can question my directing and my choice? And I went, my degree and the fact I wrote this. But the, the director goes back to what we were talking about earlier, doesn't it? The director is in service to the text, whatever it is. You've got to, you've got to make sense. Of it. And also if you change it, you might end up with something that's a bit incoherent. It, it will yeah. feel clunky. You'll, it'll feel like, oh, I've got one style over here and one style over here and then that bit there. Not only have you been disrespectful to the writer, as you, you, yeah. your example, Penny, and you, you then got a show that doesn't feel coherent or consistent within the style. Um, similarly with, um, like for me, Panto is about story and spectacle. The other thing, there's three other things for me about Panto. Another one of them is music. And again, you've got to work with your music director to get consistency of sound. Through the, through the panto. It's exactly the same as what you're saying about the writing. Yeah. And the director's job is to glue it all together, uh, yeah. to glue it all together and make it feel cohesive and, 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 and one. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask, um, obviously you work with Neil for 10 years. Um, he's, he's retired from Halifax Panto and you've just got Josh Benson okay. in. So how do they differ in their process? Obviously, Josh is energetic, like he can run for miles and not be out of breath. Whereas Neil is more all the comedy, like all routines and stuff. Like, same it's, jokes, it's, different costume. <laughs> it's really interesting. It's really interesting that that um, that when you've worked with someone for so long, the, the danger is you try and mould the next person into the previous person. Yeah. Whereas actually, you have. The thing with Panto, like with Neil and Josh, you have to, you have to work with with who they are, their energies, their their talents, and their crafts. I think um, for me, often pantomime performers are almost an extension, particularly like Damon Comic. What you see on the stage is almost like a, a times ten of who they are in real life. So 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 you so Neil um, so with Josh. 
immediately because he's he's got um, uh, backgrounds in uh, gymnastics and, and tap and, and so very different very different performer and each and each will bring their own qualities to the table and then you're right as a director I have to then go okay this is Josh this isn't this isn't Neil who the audience is used to time change and then we've got to squeeze Josh into Neil you're on a hiding to nothing you've got, you've got to, it's who's in front of you in the room their energies their crafts and don't try and repeat it so so we we shifted just shift it's just what I call it a shift of emphasis it's, there's no it's not one's better than the other like with different for me it's an emphasis now it's a lot of, it's um, almost quite zany almost comedia-esque with, with josh's energy with neil we had a lot more kind of musical theater didn't we and more yeah. and more strong and more and more patter and so for me and that's really important as a director not to lose sight of of who's in front of them, what they're bringing otherwise 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 you're trying to direct something that's not not there <laughs> yeah and uh, I think I, I I think I made that mistake really early on directing Pantos about 20, 20 odd years ago. I had an idea of what a comic should, uh, sorry, the Dane should be, and I tried to make I, I, there, was a, there was a slight tension because I was trying to create the Dame into my image of the Dame from a previous actor I'd worked with. Yeah, I said I'm a second Panto, and I thought, what what my in the late late nineties, early two thousands. No, I, I learned really quickly. Um, so it's great, and actually, and it's you, you, you come with new ideas and new energies, and and so on, and uh, yeah. But that's another piece of advice. You, we're talking about what to do as a director. That's, a, yeah. that's so a, I, I love um, the dame you, you've had the past couple. Of, I love Adam Stafford when he's on stage. <laughs> I, I think he's one of the country's best dames. Because I agree. Uh, Neil uh, once described to me that. They're both very similar in comedy, but Neil comes out with a joke straight away. About it's 50-50 if it works, or it doesn't. Whereas Adam just takes a few seconds, then comes out with a joke that works every time. And it's like that's how they should be. And what Adam does really well, and Josh and Neil, they 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 um they're they're performers who because they know their craft and they've done it for a while they they've got a really strong speed of thought and that's important in pantomime for the energy that that uh, that the speed of thought has to be quick and yeah. on the line through the line and uh, and that's an adam one of adam's fabulous qualities uh, we were talking about with the dame is to is to have that speed of thought to be in the moment to be controlled but also to to and to not let things run away to control that energy but the speed of thought is there and that's so important in tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. So over the past few years as well, uh, Imagine have really been stepping up with their technology and special effects. So like Dick Whittington, you have that massive hydraulic ship that opened up. Um, but my highlight was um, when you did Jack and the Beanstalk, the giant you had. Like I, was, yeah. I, I was sat front row and it came out, I was like, what the? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and I think again with pantomime because it's, uh, it's st the spectacle is there, isn't it? That's really important. Yeah. Um, and another quality of pantomime for me, it's as mentioned about the music, but also the magic. So, so a lot of spectacle and magic you can kind of add together again, and that's where yes, the hydraulic shift that suddenly sh turns and then moves the the coach and horses that that uh, that move come over the audience the the the, the the giant that a uh, piece of scenery the doors open at the back then there's suddenly a giant those the kids the kids have to see that in front of their eyes the magic you can't see how it works but they need to they need to have that wow moment because it's yeah. but to take them on the quest of the story and to have the the big uh, scenographic and design elements can really take you to that place and can and 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 can and can hit you in the face as it were um and and take you to a new part of the story and you mentioned like the, the giant the giant's so important as you know in jack because because that's the threat and there'll yeah. be no quest without the threat so if the giant isn't spectacular <laughs> in yeah. some way you spent the whole panto building up to a moment that that could be a damp squib so yeah. it's vital that those that they match isn't it? it's vital that they match we want to see pan fly we want to see the giant 
we want to see Cinderella go on the journey to the ball. Uh, so the, the, the interesting thing is that every company does slightly differently, don't they, as well? Yeah. There's still some common elements, but oh, what's, how are we going to do the giant? This, no, they know it's going to be a giant. How are we going to do the giant? Some, some, we have, uh, some, some companies play with, big, uh, with, with 3D or, or more UV or set pieces or a mixture of both. So it's always about trying to work out how you're going to do it. Yeah. Uh, but the, whatever happens, you've got to have some kind of impact yeah. for the quest and the story of that quest to work. Uh, and the journey to work and the adventure to work. Because what I find with um, QDOS patterns mimes, especially, um, they tend to focus more on like celebrity casting and work with twins FX, like the special effects they do are just brilliant. But at the same time, it feels like they rely too much on some of the special effects. Like some bits okay. in the up of one that, like they have a flying witch, for no reason, it's like she could have just you just wasted thirty seconds. Uh, the last one they had a uh, life size T Rex. Yeah. Then it just wasn't mentioned again. It was like. Um, I think. I think for me, I think there's got to be a balance of all of those things, and yeah. you've got to keep them all in. You've got to keep them all spinning, and you've got to make sure that things don't dominate. So, so story, spectacle, music, magic. The other thing for me is morals. Yeah, the, the, there's always a moral. It doesn't. It's not pushed or pushed through, but it's about how you deal with in adversity or danger. How you how you might overcome problems and the learning, the softer skills that are being learned, particularly for the kids. And you're modelling how people respond to problems. But you've got to keep all of those things in check. And I always think that if and a bit like the physical humour and the verbal humour. If there's too much physical humour. Then, then you then there's lots of people in the audience who want the banter. If there's too much banter in the it, it, verbal humour, which yeah. is great. If there's too much of that, you'll lose you'll lose the kids who need the spectacle. Not to say that they don't enjoy the verbal. I'm over generalising, but you know what, you know what I mean. Yeah. So you've got to got to for me then my five qualities of panto, but also um, physical and verbal have got to be balanced. You've got to balance all those things out. Um, it is tr tricky. It's a difficult art form in many ways, isn't it? I think yeah, yeah. people think it's easy, and uh, but it's it's not. You've got to got to work hard to hard to tell those stories. Yeah, uh, that's what I say. I think that's what Imagine do right. It's one of the things they do right with their pantos because they're more story driven, and the special effects that are there are there for a reason. Other than it's a, it's we've a, got it's we've got a T Rex to get on. <laughs> Need you using, get it on. I'll, I'll put one in this year. I'll put a T Rex in just for you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I can't wait for this year's Panto. Look forward to it. It's one of my so, yeah. favourite Pantos to watch if it goes ahead. Yeah. yeah. If it goes ahead. We're all, we'll, we're all hoping it, it will. But yeah, and Jack's brilliant. And I love Dame Trot as the Dame, a real feisty Dame, a real feisty, feisty Dame character. Great quest, great adventure. Um, that the, the kids go on. Now, I, there's, um, I, I remember once you're talking about because I've done a lot of celeb pantos as well. I, I remember once Lionel Blair. <laughs> oh, oh God, <laughs> yeah. here we go. Uh, but, but he but he said that I remember he was working on a pantomime and he says, uh, "Great job, celebrities and pantomime and all that." But what what he said was that I think he was directing Snow White and he said Snow White for him. So this was his personal aesthetic and way of working. It wouldn't be for every director, every producer, everyone works differently, but it says for him shouldn't be a name. So that the um so that the, the, the children don't see so and so from EastEnders as 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 Snow White. The yeah. children see Snow White. Yeah. And I've always hooked on to that. I've not always done that, but I, I I've always tried to so if I have had a celeb in a, in a, in a kind of a, a key role, a, a key story role, or the, the titular character, as it were, of Snow yeah. White or whatever, I've always got to think about making sure we're not playing too much on the other character that that person plays, because then the kids are not necessarily then in that story, they're in another. So you treat, so when I've had celebs in those roles, I treat them as actors who just so happen to be celebrities. Yeah. So I won't be putting in... Uh, 57 play ons of that one thing. This is just my personal aesthetic yeah. with pantomime. There are loads of different ways of doing it, but I really want, I'll try and not downplay that, I will make reference to it, of course, otherwise it's not pantomime. 
Um, but um, just try and make sure that there's enough, there's a couple of references there for the adults, mm. but that their celebrity or their name doesn't overtake the character and the story and the quest that they're on. Because yeah. uh, one thing I've loved as well over the years, um, some of the fantastic casts, You've had, yeah. so you've had Fliss, who was uh, the Wicked Queen last time. Yeah. You had Steve Fortune. Yeah. Um, God, what was it last name? Jamie, who, who played Flesh Creep. Um, Jamie Sherman, yeah, Jamie yeah, Sherman. Sherman. Obviously, look, a guy called Neil Hurst, I think. Yeah, well, yeah, some book, yeah, some yeah. Like that. wonder what <laughs> became of him. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, that's all my and questions. They, they're good, they're good actors. They're good actors who can tell the story, and then yeah. they, they they know their role within pantomime. They bring all that experience with them, so that that's also important to know. But yeah, but I love I love. Um, I was trying to work out why I love panto because I didn't go and see lots of pantos as a kid. Ironically, I got into it a bit a bit later on in life. But I do remember going to see like what I loved as a kid was more spectacular stuff. So I remember going to see uh, a Christmas show of Cinderella. So it was um, a, a repertory Christmas show. But I remember the, the toes getting cut off and the stage being flooded oh. with red lights and a giant red cloth coming out and then the giant red cloth just disappeared down a trap. So I remember that as a really young kid. And I remember going to see The Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe, Vanessa Ford Productions at the Theatre Royal in Henley. And I do remember the long post flying in and going, wow. And I just remember that idea of spectacle as a kid and story and things transforming in front of my eyes and, and boldness. And uh, that stayed with me. And I think then when I discovered Panto slightly later um, as, as an art form, that, 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 it resonated with me immediately. The boldness, the characters, the story, the, the magic and all of that. So, Because I, re I remember, it was years, one of the first Pantos I remember, uh, Bradford doing Aladdin. And it was the first time 3D had ever been used. And it was just literally mind-blowing. Even my mum was like, how did they just do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't. It stays with you. Yeah. And you want people to go out and remember those things. For me, theatre is a series of images. So I often say to directing students, if I say, think of Wicked, what's the main image? And they'll all think of the, fly, the flying moment. If, if you talk about... Um, Shakespeare I've just done Time of Athens and it's about the bowls and the and, and the yeah. bowls of, of water and stones or, or Ham, uh, 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 Lear <laughs> carrying his daughter. So you theatre is a series of images and what you've just described is what, what, what images do you want the what images do you want the um, the audience to leave with? What are the key, some of the key images um, as it were uh, that you want them to, to, to what, what, Want them to, want, uh, that you want to remain in the audience's imaginations. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I just have one last question. Yeah, um, you've given quite a few over the course of this podcast. Do you have any more advice for future directors? Definitely create your own work. Just do it. So I think um, uh, Adrian Noble once said, he used to run the RSC, being a director is saying you won and then doing it. Yeah. Get some actors together in a space. So if you're at university and loving drama, get a space, get a space. I know it's difficult at the moment. Get a space, yeah. create work. Find out what, and through that, you find out how you want to work, like we were talking about earlier, how you want yeah. to create work. Work out as well what kind of rehearsal energy and strategy and how do you want to, how do you want to work as well as what you're doing. So do you want to be the type of, do you want to be the type of director who, who uses, um, a certain rehearsal strategy but you also want to be the type of director who's going to say like Eva Van Hover I'm going to work for four hours a day solid so that helps for actors with parents uh, who are parents and can get to the rehearsal room and, and pick up their kid and give them time to consolidate so see as much work as possible yeah that is much work. even if you hate it you always learn something there's always some grit in the mill from you kind of go I, I wouldn't do that so do as much as you can see as much as you can uh, Emma Rice said recently, who um, she said, uh, also, if you can, get onto the board of a theatre as a young director so that you're thinking about the mechanics of how do theatres operate? How do directors relate to their board? 
what's the finances like? So if you're on the board of a, of a theatre, and you can be from quite an early age, a lot of art centres have, uh, have a youth member as well. So if you're interested in theatre, even like um, 14, 15, 16, and then it, you, kind of 16 plus, you can often be, be a younger member of a, of a, of a board. Uh, and that's, and Emma, I agree with what Emma Rice said, because you get to know how theatres operate. And then you're, you become a, and then if you've got one eye on being an artistic director, you've got to be as savvy in business as you have, as you have got to be creative on the rehearsal room floor. Um, final thing: get to know the acting process, even if you can't act like me. Get to know it because you've got to work with actors every day. You've got to love actors. You've got to love the acting process. Care for them. Care for their process understand their process. So I've got a huge load of tools in my toolkit. I like the toolkit analogy. I don't know necessarily which tool I'm gonna make. A skilled craftsman or uh, uh, might come and fix, I don't know, let's say my boiler goes. Until they get here, they don't know what tool they're going to need. And then their craft and their skill is to work out which tool for, which, for the job. Same with directing. I've got to know, okay, they're, they're, they're quite a physical actor. What can I do in this moment, immediately? What tool can I pull out of the toolkit? So by understanding the acting process, that's why in, in Russia and a lot of drama schools in the UK still, we still do a bit of acting as part of the director training, even if you never act, because, because you've got to understand what that feels like. Kate Wasserberg, who runs out of joint theatre, she says a brilliant thing. She says, um, she says, I've got my feet firmly on the ground. The actors are on a tight rope. Yeah. I'm firm, I'm on the ground, I'm all right. I go at the end of, like we were saying earlier, I go. I go when the show's up. They're the ones up in the air. They're the ones taking the big risks. They're the ones taking the leaps of being vulnerable, playing Leo every night, playing, taking on these huge emotional challenges as actors. So how do we support them? How do we support? So love actors, love the acting process, support them. You're working with them. They're not working for you. You are working with them. You're a leader amongst equals as a director. Um, so I think about all those things. As they're, they're, my, they're my five or six yeah. nuggets for what they're worth. That was some really good advice. So thank you for joining today and thank you for tuning in, everyone. That's been episode 10 of Interval Conversations. Thank you for joining. It's been brilliant. Thanks for asking me. Today's episode was brought to you by Contactless Cocktails, courtesy of the Middle Bar Halifax. You can mix and match four cocktails for £15. There is free delivery anywhere on orders. There is a minimum spend of £30. Call or text 077-335-83017 or order online at www.themiddlebar.co.uk. If you order before 5pm, you'll get same-day delivery.